So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much indeed. Still requesting you to please go to the serving spot and serve your breakfast. And just to let you know that we are live, this event is being streamed live, and we've already started. So thank you so much. Those joining us via the virtual platform, welcome. We appreciate your presence. Asante Nisana. Thank you so much. As a human family, we've had an enormous wake-up call to how connected we are with a tiny little virus that comes along and shuts us down. We all live in this world together. The same blood flows in me and every any other person. We are facing the challenges of an ecosystem that is stressed. Things are not moving as fast as they should. Things are improving, but not as fast as they should. The challenges that we are facing, they are materializing so fast that it's not only my children or grandchildren which will experience the consequences if we fail. To do it, we need to do it together. Collaboration, north, south, east, west, you know, black, brown, white. Strength in the diversity of the human family is what we need right now to get us past this incredibly difficult time. Might sound like it's impossible, but you know, that's what we work towards, making the um, impossible possible. 20 years ago, a small group of United Nations and business leaders came up with a visionary proposal. I propose that you, the business leaders here gathered in Davos, and we, the United Nations, initiate a global compact of shared values and principles which will give a human face to the global market. I always say part of Kofi Annan's genius was he invited business, but he also addressed civil society and labor organizations. The mission of the United Nations Global Compact is to mobilize companies around the world to align their operations and strategies with 10 universal principles in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. The UN represents the body that aims to drive international cooperation and drive peace and security for humanity. And I think it unifies all of society around this set of 17 goals. Our objectives uh, cannot be met if the private sector doesn't play an, a fundamental role. And so the Global Compact is a, a platform in which all those uh, businesses that abide by the principles of, uh, and values of the United Nations and of the Charter uh, to work together representing uh, the best of humankind. For the last two decades, the initiative has grown to encompass local networks in more than 60 countries, engaging directly with over 10,000 companies. 
The local networks are our global footprint around the world, and they work with us to translate the 10 principles as well as the sustainable development goals into actionable pieces of work for businesses globally. It is so decided. Since 2015, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement have provided the most powerful common agenda that the world has ever seen with an essential role spelled out for business. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. Any business that continues to operate under its own self-interest will not be around very long. So businesses that have a strong purpose, that understand how they can make society better, will be embraced by society and will be around for a long time. Be the change that you want to see in business. I truly believe that companies who do not put sustainability, the SDGs, in their strategies, they're going to disappear. The mindset of consumers has changed. They increasingly want to buy from companies that are contributing to society as a whole. Business must be part of the solution in when we address these big global problems. The focus has shifted to both the short term and the long term, both doing well and doing good, making profits and making a change. This is a reality of the world now. Leaders need to lead sustainably. The United Nations Global Compact is leading the transformation ahead, challenging companies to take more ambitious action on the sustainable development goals. I think it's absolutely impossible to face the challenges of today, the very quick change uh, that is happening without having the youth uh, leading the way and helping us define uh, the right strategies, the right policies, the right approaches to address uh, the, the global problems. The world is waking up and change is coming whether you like it or not. The world today has got more opportunities than it has the challenges um, that can be overcome by the opportunities that we have. You find people in the most desperate of situations determined to fight for a better future. That's the kind of world I want. What has changed in a very short period of time is that the narrative is different, and that is fantastic. If you want to have a good business, you have to mobilize people. A business is a sum of people working to something. More and more people realize that sustainability is really about making the pie bigger, better, and more inclusive. I hope in the future, all businesses in the world will think about their own purpose. Businesses can only exist when they have a purpose. We've got to show progress. We've got to reverse what's happening. I see the Global Compact as an incredible organization working together with businesses to build a more sustainable world. We are united across the globe for the globe. We're united despite our challenges, no matter how daunting the task may seem. We are united by possibilities because this is bigger than one business, because we are better together. We all have the same job. We are united in the business of a better world.
as a human family, we've had an enormous wake-up call to how connected we are with a tiny little virus that comes along and shuts us down. We all live in this world together. The same blood flows in me and every, any other person. We are facing the challenges of an ecosystem that is stressed. Things are not moving as fast as they should. Things are improving, but not as fast as they should. The challenges that we are facing, they are materializing so fast that it's not only my children or grandchildren which will experience the consequences if we fail. To do it, we need to do it together. Collaboration, north, south, east, west, you know, black, brown, white. Strength in the diversity of the human family is what we need right now to get us past this incredibly difficult time. Might sound like it's impossible, but you know, that's what we work towards, making the um, impossible possible. 20 years ago, a small group of United Nations and business leaders came up with a visionary proposal. I propose that you, the business, leaders here gathered in Davos, and we, the United Nations, initiate a global compact of shared values and principles which will give a human face to the global market. I always say part of Kofi Annan's genius was he invited business, but he also addressed civil society and labor organizations. The mission of the United Nations Global Compact is to mobilize companies around the world to align their operations and strategies with 10 universal principles in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. The UN represents the body that aims to drive international cooperation and drive peace and security for humanity. And I think it unifies all of society around this set of 17 goals. Our objectives uh, cannot be met if the private sector doesn't play an, a fundamental role. And so the Global Compact is a, a platform in which all those uh, businesses that abide by the principles of, uh, and values of the United Nations and of the Charter uh, to work together representing uh, the best of humankind. For the last two decades, the initiative has grown to encompass local networks in more than 60 countries engaging directly with over 10,000 companies. The local networks are our global footprint around the world, and they work with us to translate the 10 principles as well as the sustainable development goals into actionable pieces of work for businesses globally. It is so decided. Since 2015, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement have provided the most powerful common agenda that the world has ever seen with an essential role spelled out for business. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. Any business that continues to operate under its own self-interest will not be around very long. So businesses that have a strong purpose, that understand how they can make society better, will be embraced by society and will be around for a long time. Be the change that you want to see in business. I truly believe that companies who do not put sustainability, the SDGs, in their strategies, they're going to disappear. The mindset of consumers has changed. They increasingly want to buy from companies that are contributing to society as a whole. Business must be part of the solution in when we address these big global problems. The focus has shifted to both the short term and the long term, both doing well and doing good making profits and making a change. This is a reality of the world now. Leaders need to lead sustainably. The United Nations Global Compact is leading the transformation ahead, challenging companies to take more ambitious action on the sustainable development goals. I think it's absolutely impossible to face the challenges of today, the very quick change uh, that is happening, without having the youth uh, leading the way and helping us define uh, the right strategies, the right policies, the right approaches to address uh, the, the global problems. The world is waking up and change is coming whether you like it or not. <laughs> Profit!
The world today has got more opportunities than it has the challenges um, that can be overcome by the opportunities that we have. You find people in the most desperate of situations, determined to fight for a better future. That's the kind of world I want. What has changed in a very short period of time is that the narrative is different, and that is fantastic. If you want to have a good business, you have to mobilize people. A business is a sum of people working to something. More and more people realize that sustainability is really about making the pie bigger, better, and more inclusive. I hope in the future, all businesses in the world will think about their own purpose. Businesses can only exist when they have a purpose. We've got to show progress. We've got to reverse what's happening. I see the Global Compact as an incredible organization working together with businesses to build a more sustainable world. We are united across the globe for the globe. We're united despite our challenges, no matter how daunting the task may seem. We are united by possibilities because this is bigger than one business, because we are better together. We all have the same job. We are united in the business of a better world.
Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Karibu sana. We celebrate your work, your contribution. Asante sana. Welcome. So our chief guest, um, represented by um, P.S. Weru um, of Ministry of Industrialization, the UN Global Compact, uh, CEO, Executive Director, Sandal Jambo, all the way out from New York, members of um, the Global Compact uh, Network Board. This is the board um, membership who we sit with. CEOs present delegations of the UN Global Compact, again out from New York. I can see, or oh, there was Joby and a couple more. Distinguished guests again, good, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So it gives me great pleasure really to welcome you this morning to our CEO Roundtable, where we are set basically to unpack the UN Global Compact Africa strategy and present opportunities and support available for businesses in Kenya to deliver social and economic impact at scale through responsible business practices. Let me just let you in on something. When I was taking over, when, when um, the UN Global Compact put my name and I, and I went to see, I was taking over Colimo's seat uh, um, to sit on the board in New York. And I, I, I reached out to Sanda, who was then with him. Um, I think she was handling sustainability in Safaricom. And she asked me, I asked her, can I meet him? Because I want to know what is this about. And uh, he, of course, I met him. And I think at the time, he was even a little sick, so you had to be a little bit distant from him. And I asked him, what's this about? And he said, um, it's not about you. It's not about Kenya. It is actually about Africa. So you're going to sit on that position to really promote um, sustainability in Africa, not about yourself, not about, uh, about your own company. So we took that to heart. And for those of you who have been on the board in New York know that um, there was no board meeting that would pass before we say, and the Africa strategy, and the Africa strategy. I think Joby is here. And um, she, was, she was very behind me, and she kept saying, let's do this, let's do this. Fortunately enough, I think you even got funding, and um, you know, we were able to actually put this, this strategy together. So it's been a long journey to sit on a global platform where really all strategies roll out, and the Africa strategy sort of right there, sort of at the whatever. So it's a really proud moment for us this morning. So it's an opportunity really to accelerate progress towards the necessary tipping points on sustainable development priorities as Africa, it's on its way to achieving the SDGs. We're not there. We really are sort of still adopting to them. But these are the kind of conversations and strategies that will really help us move it forward. It is no secret that with the current tra trajectory, we're not going to reach the SDGs by 2030. And Africa is no exception. Really, it's a global problem. And therefore, to move this, we all must evaluate what we must do to accelerate our efforts to actually achieving the goals with only eight years to go. The SDGs are perfectly aligned with Africa's priorities for the next eight years ahead of the expiration of the Agenda 2030. Like all other economies, African economies have been severely impacted by the pandemic. So in this, we call for solidarity and justice on not only vaccine access. We must also call for financing through innovation, innovative models at this crucial time. The future of growth and its impact on poverty reduction reducing inequalities and closing the gap in climate change and gender inequality hinges on what happens to structural transformation. It is a crucial time that none of us can be complacent about. Over the next few decades, Africa has the potential to become a continent of prosperous, thriving and advancing, advanced economies, benefiting from a multitude of efforts to make progress on, this, on the SDGs. And with the establishment of the Agenda 2063, the African Union's vision for Africa, inclusive and sustainable development on the continent, has assumed a renewed urgency. Now is the time for leadership commitment and strong partnerships as we call on businesses to integrate the SDGs in their business models to achieve the goal of the 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, the UN Global Compact has contributed to a cognitive, sh a cognitive shift around the purpose of business 
and its obligation to society, shaping an enabling environment for business sustainability. In this environment, the UN Global Compact has developed an ambitious strategy to accelerate the corporate uh, sustainability and responsible business practices on the continent and champion the business sector towards contributions of development. Launched last year at the UN General Assembly Week, the Africa strategy aims to develop Africa-focused programs, engage even greater number of businesses on the continent and expand our operations and footprint on the continent to enable a genuinely Pan-African strategy and offering. So it is really by, well, I would say by Africans, we contributed, I mean, they, they really researched a lot, but it is really for us. The strategy's key fo focus is on making the UN Global Compact relevant and impactful for Africa by the African. To this end, the Global Compact has committed to develop customized prog programmatic priorities focused on the issues most relevant to businesses across the continent. Our lo local network in Kenya, Kenya has been equipped to create rich experiences for business participants of all sizes. You've seen them from the large to the, to the medium to the SMEs while engaging a growing number of external partners. Ladies and gentlemen, to all, in order to realize the vision of a prosperous, thriving, and advanced future, businesses in Africa must embrace and become strong pillars of sustainability and ethical business practices as we go along doing our businesses. Ahead of the UN Global Compact Executive Director and the CEO's address, it would be important to hear some reflections on how sustainability is redefining market opportunities for businesses across Africa by leveraging on supply chain innovation and all the things that we tend to do. As I conclude, I'm optimistic that companies here today, which represent the broader private sector, will be a driving force in mobilizing businesses for impact. To continue making progress and expanding our impact across Africa, your support here as Kenyan business leaders will be absolutely key. Thank you once again for taking time to join us at this CEO's round table. And let me conclude with the remarks um, that I heard from uh, our, the newly appointed president at the COP26. Uh, I think she was called Alok Sharma of the UK. She said, we can move the negotiations forward. We can launch a decade of ever increasing ambition of act and action. Together we can seize the enormous opportunities for green growth, for good green jobs, for cheaper, cleaner power. But we must hit the ground running to develop the solutions we need. And this work must start today. We must succeed or fail as one. As one, we fail, we succeed as one. It is not about you and I, not about Kenya, it's about Africa. This is a crucial time none of us can be complacent about. Now is the time for, for leadership commitment and strategic partnerships. Thank you so much. Another beautiful round of applause to Ms. Flora. Thank you so much indeed. Excellent. We move on, ladies and gentlemen. She has more than 20 years' experience in the public, multilateral and private sectors, including as head of sustainable business and social impact, Safaricom PLC in Kenya, and capacity development work in Care International and United Nations Development Program of Somalia. Throughout her career, she has cultivated and managed relationships with key business entities and civil society organizations and led the implementation of several public-private partnership initiatives. Please welcome CEO and Executive Director of the United Nations Global Compact, Miss Sanda Ojiambo. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please. CEO and Executive Director, UN Global Compact, Miss Sanda Ojiambo. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, I, I have to say, it's a real pleasure to be here um, in Nairobi at this time and, and be back home. But actually, what I really want to say, it's a pleasure to be here specifically at this time 
because I get to escape the ongoing and severe New York winter, even for just a few days. So it's, it's really glad to be here. But you know, most importantly, looking around the room and seeing lots of familiar faces, familiar organizations, as well as new organizations that I've had the opportunity to interact with, it just reinforces for me really the importance of the sustainable business agenda for Kenya and the opportunities, the achievements, and the successes that we all have um, around this area of work. It's been encouraging, even from where I sit in New York now, to observe the growth, the continued interest, the momentum, despite the challenges that we've all faced over the last two years brought about by the COVID pandemic. And despite these challenges and actually changes, I wanted to reflect on one thing that has remained the same over the last four years. According to the Edelman Trust Barometer Survey, which is a survey of close to 40,000 people in 28 countries around the world, both developed and emerging economies, business remains the most trusted institution in the world over the last four years. And this is business when it's ranked against government, the media, the NGO sector, and yeah, government, the media, and the NGO sector. A couple of highlights. Now more than ever, there's a great expectation of business to lead because trust in other entities continues to spiral. But this is not a job that business can do on its own. So business must work with other institutions to foster innovation and to drive impact. At the same time, and this is a real imperative for all of us here, stakeholders want businesses to engage in finding solutions to societal issues. They want businesses to use their business processes, their business outcomes, to make sure that we can shift and make real impact for society. So for the CEOs in the room, and, and no pressure to you here, but expectations are very high for CEOs to speak out publicly on social, political, and economic issues. But speaking out is not enough. What the survey also said is that 81% of respondents want CEOs to be front and center on discussing public policy and discussing what their companies have done to address societal problems. So the pressure is on, not just for business to do business, but for business to truly get involved in societal transformation. And I think many of you here over the past two years of the pandemic have done so. The challenge is how do we do so sustainably and in a way that really drives forward the country's economic development. So with that framing in mind and that clear call to action for business, it's truly a pleasure to talk about the UN Global Compact and talk about our new Africa strategy and speak about how we can leverage the business leadership in the room and the business leadership in Kenya to accelerate progress towards social transformation and the SDGs in Africa. For those who may not know about the Global Compact, I know there's a short video, but allow me to recap. The Global Compact is a special initiative of the United Nations formed in the year 2000 by the then Secretary General Kofi Annan. <coughs> Excuse me. And Kofi Annan wanted to bring what he called a human face to the global market. And simply put, what Secretary General Annan was saying was it was evident and it was obvious that business could not succeed sustainably with the unsustainable exploitation of natural resources, of people, of fragile supply chains and value chains. And I think the fragility of supply chains is one thing that we all saw over the last two years, when you weren't able to get your favorite item from the supermarket. I remember particularly when I was looking for hand sanitizer and uh, someone mentioned to me that the pumps, the actual pump mechanism, wasn't available because it was made in China and it was stuck on a ship somewhere or something like that. But we all realize that we are actually at the mercy of very fragile supply chains. You know, there's an important day that was marked in August last year. It's called Earth Overshoot Day. And this is the day in which human consumption exceeds the available natural resources. And this year, it fell, it continues to fall earlier and earlier each year. This year, it fell three weeks earlier in August. So in other words, globally, our current models of production and consumption are off balance and broken. Year on year, we are consuming much more than we can produce and much more than the earth can provide for us in terms of natural resources. So Kofi Annan, as you saw in the video, foresaw that the business of business had to involve engaging on societal issues such as environment, climate change, anti-corruption, and the respect and promotion of rights. 
So here we are today at the Global Compact. I'm truly humbled and privileged to be able to lead this organization, certainly as a representative of Kenya, uh, my home country, and leading a group of over 15,000 leading companies. It certainly is still a drop in the ocean globally. We have great ambition. But what we also have is a very clear recognition that the African continent at this point in time is probably the only continent that can pursue industrialization and economic growth on a sustainable and an inclusive path if the continent so chooses to do so, because we have the opportunity. And at the Global Compact, we're very aware, looking into the future, that our agenda must respond to the incredible opportunity that Kenya and certainly the African continent holds. So as Flora had mentioned, you know, we have spoken a lot about the Africa strategy over time. And I just felt that it was imperative in my time there that we bring this uh, strategy to life, to being, and roll it out as, as, as inclusively and as broadly as we could on the continent. The principles of the UN Global Compact help make businesses market ready, partner ready, and investor ready. Because we address key issues such as environmental footprint and traceability, decent work and living wages, anti-corruption. We simply provide guardrails to keep business in business and therefore drive competitive advantage and commercial success. The Africa strategy has immense support and approval from our board, which is chaired by the current UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. Other board members allow me to acknowledge Flora Motahi, as she has mentioned. She sits on our global board alongside 23 other global business leaders. And the Africa strategy aims to support and accelerate the growth of business and the private sector on sustainable business. I'll dive into a little bit of the detail on the strategy. I believe copies of the strategy booklet are available here, and it's certainly available on the website. But I think what is most important is the fact that we're positioning our local network here, that's led by my colleague Judy, I know who will be speaking later, to really form a core of, of operations and of programming and work that we believe is relevant for Kenya and certainly will be relevant for the continent. So the strategy has three key interlocking objectives. The first is focus. And the idea here is to grow the UN Global Compact's impact on the African continent through focus. We want to focus on the issues and the programs that are most relevant to Kenya and to African companies. And when we developed the strategy, as Flora also alluded to, we did this in a very consultative manner, receiving inputs and insights from many Kenyan businesses, some of you are in the room, certainly African and global businesses. And some of the topics that resonated as priorities were how to grow and support economic resilience for the SME sector, the role of business in the UN in convening to address policy and regulatory environments, affordable access to capital to enable energy and climate transitions, for example. We also want to focus on ensuring that the leading pan-African and national companies can participate because large companies can take risks. They can lead on business advocacy and they can mobilize ecosystems. And then we want to focus on the geographic reach of our local networks because we must move faster and further to drive change and to deliver on impact. And talking of impact, our second area is driving inclusive impact. We want to be sure that we can include companies large and small. I know there is a general perception sometimes, at least at the headquarter level, that the Global Compact only works with large businesses. Another strategy that we've developed and uh, soon to launch is an SME strategy, specifically looking at the value that the Global Compact can give to the SME sector. And we also want to make sure that we include all sectors, emerging and legacy. The third part of our Africa strategy is to leverage associations, supply chains, and sources of capital. So you'll see our partnerships emerge and evolve in many ways. We want to work with associations such as Chambers of Commerce, Federations of Kenya Employers, and many others, because together we can certainly achieve more. Supply chains, we must work with them for their holistic coverage of value creation. And we must work with sources of capital because they can actually influence good business practice. As part of our regional plan, we'll continue to engage broadly across the continent. We will establish a regional Africa hub in Nigeria and have three other centers, one right here in Kenya, one in South Africa, and one in Morocco to serve as focal centers to deliver the strategy. And at the same time, we will partner with other businesses and the United Nations footprint to expand our work initially in countries such as Rwanda, Angola, Botswana, and Cote d'Ivoire. 
The local network here, as has been mentioned, will be supported and equipped to create richer experiences for our business participants, grow our partnerships, and promote policy engagement on a local level. And as part of my schedule this week, we're meeting a couple of key business leaders to discuss how to co-create and review some of those strategic partnerships. Furthermore, in preparation for the climate conference, COP27, that takes place in Africa in November, a really important milestone for all of us on the African continent, we will establish what I call the Africa Business Leaders Coalition. And you'll certainly hear, mo hear more about this during the course of the week. We see this coalition, which will comprise of Africa's most admired, exemplary, and essential private sector leaders, operating as an organized, forward-looking, principle-based, and unified voice for promoting growth and prosperity in Africa, including forging a green, just, and equitable transition. And many of those African leaders I know will come from Kenya. So in summary, we have an ambitious strategy for the Global Compact in Africa. We believe that Kenya is a critical part of that. We have a thriving and sustainable private sector and a fantastic vision for prosperity and economic growth. So I'd like to encourage the companies here and the business leaders to support, partner, provide technical inputs and financial resources to go towards the Global Compact Africa strategy. I certainly believe that Kenya and Africa's future is worth the investment and truly look forward to working with you as we continue to drive forward our Africa strategy. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much indeed. So there you have it. Together we can do more. The business of business is engaged in societal issues. And business is not just about doing business, but really being involved in societal transformation. Ladies and gentlemen, up next. She has more than 27 years experience in organizational leadership and development with an ability to prepare and implement strategic business plans and mobilize resources for implementation. She has served as the principal secretary in the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, State Department for Industrialization, State Department of East African Affairs, and as the chief executive of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers for 11 years. Her strategic approach to business entails regional integration, industrial development, private sector development, good governance, and sustainable development. Please welcome the Cabinet Secretary, Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development, Honorable Betty Maina. Of course, representing her, we have Ambassador Johnson, Weru, Principal Secretary, State Department for Trade and Enterprise Development, Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development. Thank you very much. Uh, the director of ceremonies and a happy good morning to everybody good morning, good morning. for avoidance of doubt <laughs> <laughs> i'm representing uh, honorable betty minor the cabinet secretary for industrialization trade and enterprise development uh, we are in very interesting times uh, because the top leadership of the ministry, right now, uh, we are going through the transition. And so one of our deputy ministers resigned to join politics. We remained behind. The, the other one is bereaved. And today there was a, an important meeting of government ministers. So I was deployed here to come and... Uh, deliver her statement. But before I do so, uh, let me join uh, those in the room and elsewhere uh, to celebrate uh, Sandra Diabo. <laughs> Sandra, you may never know, but I'm going to disclose this to you. <laughs> before joining the Ministry of Trade, I was in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, we were part of the foot soldiers. 
but really worked hard to praise you where you are. Amen. And every time I go to New York and in the corridors I meet people who tell me about you, it gives us that joy of knowing that, knowing that you have served your country. And the last time we were there with the president, I also bounced on another uh, lady, uh, Alice Delito, who is there, the Secretary for Humanitarian Affairs. And this is the office th that uh, declares genocide. So I was trying to tell Alice, please don't do that to our neighbors <laughs> in the north, because it would have catastrophic effects on the economy of Kenya. So it's good to be with you this morning. And before I deliver the statement, now let me make mine. <laughs> I'll speak to you from two perspectives. The first perspective is this uh, body that we formed and which started trading 1st of January last year, the Africa continent of free trade area. And the second one is the trade negotiations uh, that uh, one we have concluded with the United Kingdom and the other is the ongoing one with the United States. And the role of all of us in taking forward Kenya's economic transformation agenda. And two things come out. That those of us who are now midwiving the growth of this country, to move from the level where we are as a country beyond, we need to stabilize trade. We need to stabilize trade in all perspectives, especially trade in services. And we are coming out clearly to say so, so that in the economies that are now middle income, they are at that level because they are no longer trading in commodities and the raw materials. They are involved in value addition and in, uh, in <coughs> promoting and protecting intellectual property rights. They are also involved in enforcing standards. So we are at a threshold of making sure that moving forward, we are going to promote Kenya's SMEs from the government level, not only to produce, but to produce market quality goods and services. And therefore, Sandra, when you go back to New York, Part of the things that you are interested in from the UN system is the speedy reform of the UN. So that those ambitions that we have expressed all these years can come to fruition. We are going to have the UN Environment Authority towards the end of the month. We'll be hosting that, and you know, we don't have many friends. There are people who are fighting to move the UN headquarters out of Nairobi. And we are assisting and saying, we have everything that it takes. We have fought very hard to have uh, this office of the UN at the same level with Geneva and Vienna. So, as Kenya, we have to provide world-class services like this particular facility. Nobody should say in New York, oh, there are no hotels in Nairobi. They are there. Nobody should say, oh, it takes two hours to leave the airport and get to the UN. The evidence is just here next to you. We have all these things, and we have to sing and praise them. This is your country. And finally, for the American society, I see some water here. would like to kind of socialize the American corporate sector. Please do that for us. I don't know what happens 
When you speak to the American corporate sector, all these business organizations, the Atlantic Council, the Business for Understanding, the American Chamber of Commerce, they are aligned 100% to the government policy. So when Trump lost and Biden comes in, they change quickly. But I have taken time to tell them. So you are told that Africa cannot trade because we have challenges of human rights, challenges of democracy, challenges of uh, workers' rights. And I told these colleagues that we were negotiating around the table, show me how many treaties of the International Labor Organization that America has not signed. Not that the ones that have signed, the ones that has not ratified. We have done more. So in terms of protecting workers' rights, in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, so don't use that as an excuse. So when we come to trading, because governments don't trade, I'm inviting all of you. Whatever you can do, start. If you encounter a challenge, that is a good beginning. That is what we are looking for. Bring those challenges to us so that we can say, I tried to sell this and I encountered this challenge. I tried to access this particular network. I encountered this challenge. That is the conversation we want to start in this compact. And that is exactly why I, was, uh, I didn't hesitate to come and uh, join you and uh, give you just that bit of what I thought was necessary uh, for the purpose of uh, saying what the government is doing. I am not a politician, but it's good to say where we have an effort, we have an effort. And you have a very good uh, ambassador in New York, Ambassador Martin Kemani, you know what he's doing in the Security Council. And in the entire UN family, we are there to support him. And we are there, he's there also to support you, Sandra. So that wherever you go, you carry the Kenyan flag, you carry the African flag, and the flag of the developing countries. So that in the next few years, our, our total percentage of global trade can at least rise by a reasonable percentage, maybe 5%. For Africa, we can move from 6 to 10%. That can be your performance contract. So that, and to achieve that, you know what you need to do. So this congregation here is part of your uh, stakeholders. There are many. But the most important is that they are listening, they are willing, and very patriotic. Now I am the minister. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> and when you, when you deliver the statement of the minister, you don't add anything else. Let us listen to the minister. Sanda Ojiambo, the UN Group of Compact Executive Director and CEO, the CEOs of industry, and representatives from the private sector, representatives from the government agencies, development agencies and civil societies represented here, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to join you this morning to exchange ideas on how the government and the private sector can strengthen mutual collaboration and harness opportunities for business within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals. I am glad that we are discussing this at a time when governments across the globe, Kenya included, are faced with overwhelming and competing challenges as they continue to navigate the far-reaching impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. As countries with their options, it has become increasingly clear that the private sector will play a pivotal role in the collective global recovery. Thus, the focus of this loud table, which is mobilizing African business for impact, is quite appropriate and pertinent for our current times 
and our long-term sustainable recovery beyond the pandemic. As a government, we have long recognized the critical role of business in delivering the promise of sustainable and inclusive development. In a mixed economy such as ours, the private sector constitutes the largest sector of the economy. And Kenya, like many other nations, acknowledges that this sector is the agent of investment, innovation, and growth. In supporting the inclusive and sustainable growth of this sector, we as a government are keen to continue playing our two crucial roles, which are regulatory role and promotional or development role. Most will be familiar with the regulatory role of the government, which apart from providing legitimacy to business, also involves formulating and implementing various direct and indirect measures to monitor and regulate the economic activities of the private sector. On the other hand, the promotional role of the government involves policies and measures taken for the advancement of economic development infrastructure. This includes economic and social overhead capital that is necessary for the growth of industries, optimal utilization of resources, and the improvement of the productive capacity of our economy. Both of these roles go hard in hand and are essential for the sustainable growth of the private sector. Since the early 2000s, there has been increasing recognition of the importance of public-private dialogue towards the improvement of the business environment and establishment of policies, laws, and regulations conducive to private sector development. As a government, we are acutely aware that transformative and lasting change cannot be achieved without strategic collaboration and partnerships with those outside the public sphere. Therefore, the private-public dialogues have provided us with a platform for gathering, analyzing, and the compilation of information on key economic development trends and for the espousing of policy alternatives to government. They have also provided an inclusive environment for the appraisal of various programs and activities of government, including investment programs for economic development, for the purpose of determining the extent to which such programs and activities have contributed to the achievement of government policy objectives. Lastly, but not least, they have also helped to improve the impact of strategic policies, particularly the most critical social and economic needs, especially in the areas that have a direct impact on strengthening the potential of the private sector to create employment opportunities and those that address poverty reduction. As a result, in recent years, Kenya's performance in legislative and regulatory reforms has been impressive. We have already taken measures to implement these reforms to improve the business environment and to promote a true market economy. We have been able to achieve these expansive business reforms through a committed, sustained, and action-oriented dialogue with our private sector. Through these public-private dialogues, the private sector has been and continue to be a strategic partner of government in policy formulation, regulation, and in the expansion of trade and investment, and the creation of markets for Kenyan goods and services. The Ministry of Industrialization, Trade and Enterprise Development is indeed the agency where one could say the private sector is directly domiciled. We have a mandate to create a competitive and sustainable private sector by ensuring an enabling policy and regulatory environment and also working with other agencies ensuring that the requisite infrastructure is in place to facilitate business. The Ministry is also an important in stimulus for the provision of critical linkages and the growth of the other sectors of the economy. We are thus a significant contributor to employment creation and the poverty reduction for the country. As we engage with the private sector at, <coughs> at, some, at all levels, some of our key strategies include enhancing productivity and competitiveness, enhancing market access and export expansion, overseeing the equitable dis passion of industries throughout the country, investment attraction 
and technology and innovation transformation, amongst other strategies. We have currently embarked on a post-COVID transition with due cognizance that sustainable long-term recovery will hinge on innovative measures for business and industry. We have to go beyond traditional means for economic recovery. Towards this, we have already laid the ground for working very closely with all our private sector partners and stakeholders to develop appropriate policy measures. These include support for the development of new business models, the upgrading of technologies and innovation, exploration of new sources of inputs, the diversion of products, the identification of new markets, and the further strengthening of the partnership between public and private sector. As we discuss new business models and technologies, I know that this forum will also look at opportunities for business. This is an opportune time to focus on implementing sustainable solutions in line with the UN Global Compact Principles. For instance, the opportunities in leveraging linkages across sectors, particularly in building the enabling environment for industrial development. Essential infrastructure, including water, energy, communication and transport, are particularly important for all economic activities and play a critical role in enabling industrial development. We would therefore look to industrial development powered by renewable energy and to supporting water waste production methods among the sustainable strategies. To conclude, let me reiterate once again the importance of the private sector to our economic development and the <coughs> work commitment as a government to supporting the growth of this sector and to further strengthening of our mutual collaboration. Together, we can work towards development-oriented economic growth by shifting our focus to retaining and creating wealth, better managing our resources, fostering inclusiveness, moving up on the global value chain, diversifying our economy, optimizing the energy mix, and placing human capital at the center of our innovations. For this to happen, the government needs the innovative ability of the private sector, and the private sector needs the facilitative power of government. Our doors remain open, and we look forward to working with all of you. Thank you very much, and I wish all of us profitable outcomes. Signed, Betty Minor Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Let's appreciate the peers. Asante Sana. Thank you so much. And of course, in absentia, the CS. Thank you so much indeed. We have to go beyond traditional means to have economic recovery. And definitely, a key challenge, we need to stabilize trade, especially in services, produce market quality goods and services, provide world-class services. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to that place where we now want to dramatically appreciate the launch, the African strategy. So a big round of applause once again as I call upon well, a PS Ambassador Johnson, where will please come forward? I'll also call upon CEO, Executive Director, UN Global Compact, please come forward, and also board member, Miss Flora Mutahi Makofia, out the Fadali. A big round of applause for them. So we'll have a countdown, and in a more traditional manner, I'd kindly request that we be upstanding for this moment. So ladies and gentlemen, we are ready. and
gentlemen, a big round of applause as we celebrate the launch of Santisana. Thank you so much indeed. Excellent. Makofita Fadali. Fantastic. When businesses unite, they can be a powerful force for good by upholding universal principles in the areas of human rights, labor, the environment, and anti-corruption. Asante Nisana, you may kindly take your seats. Excellent, so now that we have it, we have heard, we have been part of the conversation. Now we want to open it up to you now, to share your thoughts. We have a microphone and we are asking a very simple question. Asante. A big round of applause once again. Thank you so much. Excellent. You may kindly take your seats now, Asante Sana. Excellent, excellent. We have, a, we have a simple question. How can the Kenyan private sector engage with the United Nations Global Compact Africa strategy and its objectives? Very simple question. And your contribution is very critical in pushing the conversation forward towards achieving the Africa we want. So kindly consider that. How can the Kenyan private sector engage with the UN Global Compact Africa strategy and its objectives. As you consider that, I'd kindly request that we appreciate the presence of... His experience in the communications industry spans more than 35 years, of which the last 20 have been at executive committee level. He served at Telcom as the principal assistant to the managing director and chief strategy and regulatory officer. He later joined Safaricom as chief corporate affairs officer. Please welcome the chief special projects officer as well as chairman of Safaricom Foundation, Mr. Joseph Ogutu. Big round of applause. Karibu Sana, Mr. Joseph Ogutu, Chairman, Chief Special Projects Officer, Safaricom Foundation. Excellencies, Excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me join the previous speakers in saying how delighted I am this morning to be here because uh, you know, COVID has made it very difficult for us to interact. So uh, to be in a room completely full is a delight. And it means that uh, hopefully we are overcoming the pandemic. I am honored to be here this morning on behalf of our CEO, Peter Ndegwa. Peter would have loved to be here. He's a great believer in the UN Global Compact, but he was not able to move uh, certain engagements uh, from his calendar. Be it as it may, uh, I'm glad it is me who is here. <laughs> yeah, because uh, uh, Sanda was a colleague of mine for 12, 12 years. And we worked very closely uh, when she was uh, head of sustainability uh, and also um, uh, uh, social impact. So Sanda Karibu. Karibu Nyumbani, it's, uh, it's, it's really good to see you. Let me say a few things about sustainability and then I'll sit. Recently, I came across an interesting write-up which describes sustainability as follows. 
that sustainability is about spending on CSR, is nominating a sustainability manager, and growing trees. <laughs> you know, the unfortunate reality, there are still very many companies that believe that sustainability is simply that. But the good news is that more and more companies are beginning to take sustainability very, very seriously. And let me take this opportunity to commend East African breweries who have recently launched their uh, inaugural, inaugural sustainability report. You know, a uh, company's ability to put sustainability at the forefront has become an increasing relevant consideration uh, for businesses and shareholders. The current pandemic has certainly brought to the fore the importance of purpose and sustainability. We all know that the, pande the pandemic altered uh, uh, the environment for all businesses besides the public health crisis, the resultant economic shocks. All of these have been extremely tough. But alongside government initiatives as provision of vaccines, there was a need for the private sector to step in to cushion businesses, particularly micro, small, and medium enterprises that are a lifeblood for our economies. It was important that we come together to protect jobs. Now that we are slowly moving into recovery, there's need to continue offering our support. However, for the recovery to be durable and resilient, a return to business as usual will not work. If unchecked, global environmental emergencies such as climate change could cause social and economic damages far greater than that which has been caused by COVID-19. As the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres recently said, with humanity on the edge of an abyss and moving in the wrong direction, the world must wake up. The pandemic has indeed made a strong case for ensuring a resilient, sustainable, and more uh, responsible business model. So if sustainability is not the three things I mentioned, that like spending on CSR, recruiting a sustainability manager, and growing trees, so what does it mean? Allow me to reflect on the Safaricom experience. For the last decade, we have been able to document sustainability, our sustainability journey because we believe in holding ourselves accountable by sharing our successes, our challenges, and constraints in public, in an open, in a transparent manner. But even more important, we believe that we have a duty to raise awareness of the sustainability challenges we face as a society and to ensure that these remain part of a broader discussion in, country, in the country and also globally. However, our sust uh, sustainability did not just start 10 years ago, but actually started since inception in 2000. We believed then that our duty was not just to provide connectivity for Kenyans, but we also exist to transform, to touch, and to transform lives. We developed our first official sustainability report in 2012 by first defining our sustainability vision, conducting a sustainability risk analysis, and then classifying our eight key material matters and identifying stakeholders. We also started tracking and reporting on our carbon footprint. Just one year later, in 2013, we changed our materiality assessment from a risk-based approach to business imperatives and opportunities which allowed us to look at the initiatives we needed to realize our potential for growth. That same year, we started the process of integrating sustainability in our supply chain, and some of our suppliers are here, and they will tell you that we take this very, very seriously. So we incorporate that in our supply chain, and also um, encourage our suppliers to carry out self-assessment um, with regard to sustainability. In 2014, we redefined 
our sustainability strategy and made firm short-term and long-term commitments around the eight material matters. Part of this strategy included engaging an independent firm for the first time to conduct sustainability assurance on our key material numbers. In 2015, we once again reviewed our sustainability strategy and reduced our material matters from eight to four in order to sharpen our focus. In addition to this, we engaged KPMG uh, to do a true value report on us which allowed us to evaluate through an independent party the total value we create for the society over and above our financial profit. Our latest true value earnings indicate that the value to Kenyan society we created increased 1.5% over the year 2020 uh, 20 to 2021, and that we contributed a total of 5.2% to the country's GDP. One year after we introduced the true value methodology, we took another major step in our sustainability report journey when we began the process of integrating the sustainable development goals into our business strategy. We have adopted nine of the 17 SDGs and incorporated these into our performance objectives, both as a company and at individual uh, employee level. So on, take my example, for instance, I have to report on three uh, SDGs. Uh, those are assigned to me in my role as the Chief of Special Projects. So in 2018, we were named for the first time as a global compact lead uh, company for high levels of engagement as a participant of the United Nations Global Compact, and we have been included in the list ever since. So last year, with the assistance of an independent party, we conducted a desktop uh, benchmarking exercise to understand and compare our material issues. Out of this exercise, we have added partnerships and platforms as part of our key material matters to reflect our transition from a telco to a technology company in line with the Safaricom's new strategy. And the plan is that to 2025, we will be a technology company as opposed to a telco. Today, we continue to be guided by our purpose of transforming lives, and the SDGs which sit at the heart of our business strategy informs everything that we do. So by staying true to our purpose, we're helping farmers through our digital farm uh, platform, we're helping farmers to improve their agricultural practices and giving them access to inputs and credit. We're empowering learners with access to education and breaking down barriers to allow Kenyans all over the country to access quality, affordable medical care uh, through MTIBA. Guided by our purpose, we are also using our voice to advocate for better government, governance, uh, to protect the rights of children, to push for greater diversity and inclusion in the workplace, and to raise awareness about climate change. On diversity and inclusion, by the way, currently uh, at the top leadership, we are at 34% female. And we feel this is bad. And so we are aiming to be at 50-50 by the end of 20, uh, by, by the end of the FY ending uh, March 2023, to be at 50-50 is a huge challenge, but we are committed. And we have to report on these things, otherwise, you know, it can be just lip service. We have to report on these things, and you people have to challenge us that you committed to this and you didn't deliver. As I conclude, leaders, we must create a mindset of leading from purpose that will enable us to accelerate the delivery of sustainable businesses. We must continue to borrow and share best practices on how we can pull together, manage resources, and be visionary and be ethical. We must, we must also realize that no leader, no company, no industry can succeed in creating sustainable society in isolation. All this we have to do together. We must take collective action by consistently engaging like-minded business partners, sparring actions, encouraging each other in order to achieve the sustainable development goals. As someone once said, individually we're one trop, but together we're an ocean. I thank you for your kind attention. Wow, wow, wow. 
that is a powerful start off point as you consider your thoughts and how we can engage the Africa strategy a mindset of leading from purpose and the vision from telcom a telcom to a technology company so opening it up for your thoughts if you have a comment a thought a contribution in regards to how the private sector how can the Kenyan private sector engage with the UN Global Compact Africa strategy and its objectives? So you can just, ah, excellent. So we have one contribution there, another one. We can take a couple of them. Uh -huh. So let's have that microphone there. All right. Thank you, Makasi. I'm Peter B. Watt. I'm the managing director of Eldoret Water and Sanitation Company um, in Wasengishu County in Eldred. I think the conversation should be also more about public sector, because I've heard about private sector and global compact. Like for example, in our company, which is a limited company, but public sector, we deliver water and sanitation to over 500,000 uh, 500, people in Eldred. And I think we speak a lot to SDG number six on access to universal coverage on water and sanitation and particularly focusing on women, children, and vulnerable groups, as well as SDG number 11, on sustainable communities and cities. And in, the, and in Eldred, was in Kishu, we normally host an annual event called Climate Action Marathon. And I think in this year, April 10th, we're going to have a four, uh, the fourth edition. And we're going to inaugurate a Climate Action Conference. And for the last three or four seasons, we have, we've actually planted over five million trees. So I would like to appeal and urge that um, we need to hear more of public sector. How can global compact ideals be injected in the public sector? And I believe in Kenya currently, we are the leading one as held red water. Thank you very much. So the conversation should not just revolve the private sector we must also have a conversation with the public sector. Thank you so much indeed. Another comment please, a contribution. The question at hand is simply how how can the Kenyan private sector engage with the United Nations Global Compact Africa strategy and its objectives? A thought, a comment, contribution, probably a question. Ah, excellent. So we have a comment there. Any other so that we can move swiftly? All right, go ahead. Uh, hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. Hello, everyone. Uh, William Mukoyo. <coughs> I'm the ESG manager for Victoria Commercial Bank. Uh, when we are discussing about the private sector, my contribution will uh, simply just put is, uh, especially in the financial space, uh, the businesses are involved in uh, financing, we should start talking about sustainable finance rather than looking into financing operations that we know are unsustainable and also are not in line with the UN Global Compact principles. Uh, as financial sectors, we should start taking a leading role in just producing sustainable financing, entering into business, onboarding clients that are specifically geared towards sustainable financial initiatives. Yeah, so that's my contribution. Excellent. Thank you so much indeed. Any other thought? Excellent. So let's come this way. So you have sustainable finance. Very important. Go ahead. Hello. Good, on, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Clifford Machoka uh, from Nation Media Group. And I think my question or maybe a challenge to the UN Global Compact is, uh, you know, the, the whole discussion on climate change is quite topical and uh, following COP26. But I think one of the things that we have seen in the continent is the aspect of global change being seen to be very far removed from the continent and being seen as an issue that uh, is mostly affecting the industrialized nations more than the African nations. Uh, the question of the UN Global Compact is how can we regionalize 
or how can we drive regionalization of climate change um, in this part of the world? Engaging this part of the world. Thank you so much indeed for that common question. Thank you so much. Another common question, thought, suggestions before we close the session. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Kisa from Kenya Bixa, the general manager of Kenya Bixa. I think the, I will contribute that the private sector in engaging with the strategy, African strategy is to look at the overall strategy of Africa and the global, com uh, global uh, scene and then now look at the strong points in every private sector. Look at where you are operating, your operating space and then now strategize starting with your strong points, and then moving now uh, as you add more of the uh, strategic goals. Thank you. All right. Examine your operating space and start from your strong points. All right. Go ahead, go ahead. Microphone on the other side. Oh, so let's start there, then we move to the other side. Go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I decided to speak because I think all the men were speaking and in the spirit of gender diversity I had to stand up. So very good morning to you. My name is Tosif Dean, CEO MP Shah Hospital. As we engage, uh, engage uh, Sando Jambo and the UNGC and I think uh, our friend there mentioned the public sector. Today we are concentrating on the private sector. But I think what COVID-19 has done in the healthcare sector is something that everyone is aware of. The Kenyan healthcare sector is very fragile. And a lot of things have happened over the last three years in the healthcare sector. That has been a wake up clarion call for all of us to be able to speed up supply chain management, to be able to have accessibility to medical infrastructure and medical furniture. In light of that, I challenge UNGC to devise mechanisms to be able to include the healthcare sector more actively. The healthcare sector has a big role to play in the management of the pandemic and sustainability. Thank you. Wow. More actively involve the health sector, the fragile sector, speed up supply chain management. We're ready? Go, take it away. Uh, good, af good morning, everybody. Uh, sounds like afternoon already, but sorry. <laughs> I mean, uh, sorry. Uh, my name is Charles Mdiwa. I'm the CEO of Stand Big Bank. Um, thank you very much for the discussion and the presentations that have been done. But I just want to take a probably slightly different angle. Um, when we talk of sustainability and Stand Big Bank, we have really been uh, driving this up. Uh, we publish our annual sustainability report every year. Um, and we certainly believe um, that we will look at that. Uh, to Joe, uh, Safaricom is at 34% women, we're at 60% women in the executive team. So we can teach you a few things. Uh, <laughs> um, and our board is also at 51%. So, okay. So I think, but the, the point I want to raise is that a couple of months ago, I see a couple of CEOs here, I think we were invited by Nature Conservancy. Um, and we went to uh, spend a day the Tana River uh, catchment area. Um, and what we saw there was a lot of siltation going into the Tana River, which supplies, as you know, Nairobi with the bulk of its water. But the issue that was there was that the farmers were basically growing crops in the catchment area on the river bed. And of course, then consequence of that, we get pollution, chemicals, and everything else going to the water, which affects the quality of water for Nairobi. And when we had spent time in engaging the farmers, the issue was not about they did not understand or don't know that they're creating a sustainability issue, but the issue was of poverty. How can we live and how can we survive? What must we do? Because we need to grow our crops. 
if there's a drought, the only water that's available is on the riverbed. And so we have no choice but to actually grow crops there. So as we deal with this as the private sector, my challenge with the private sector is we cannot remove ourselves from the poverty debate in Africa. We cannot remove ourselves from underdevelopment in Africa. And when I listened to these kinds of co-op in, 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 uh, in Scotland, it was all about, okay, the big thing is industrialization, but it did not deal about the grassroots guy who is a hustler or trying to do something somewhere in, um, in Gikomba or somewhere in Muranga or something in Lake Turkana. I mean, they are really trying to do themselves and make themselves live a daily wage. Now, to then talk about sustainability, that person, I mean, like we saw the farmers in Muranga, I mean, yes, you're telling them you are plowing in the riverbed of Lake Tru or what, I mean, Trukana River, but they'll tell, I mean, Tana River, but they tell you, well, I have to grow. I have to eat my feed, my family. What must I do? So what is our role as the private sector? We have to start dealing with the poverty issue as a private sector. That's the only way we can then start to address sustainability globally, even as a country. Unless we deal with the ordinary person who is trying to live every day and give them something to do, then it becomes a problem. Second issue is our populations are all very young and they are all trying to figure out what to do. So how do we deal with that from a young population point of view that is still trying to build up? So the bigger debate that we're discussing, they are all average age 30 and my bank average is between 30 and 35. So how do you deal with that and how do you address, unless we start focusing that on the strategy and face up to it and not leave it to Ambassador Ware and government to deal with, but we, the private sector, take a leading role in driving that agenda. We cannot win the sustainability issue. Thank you. Well, excellent. The poverty problem, dealing with the ordinary person and, of course, the young population. So we'll have just uh, one more slot. Do we have one person? Excellent. Go ahead. It might be two. There's somebody oh, on that side. That's all right. So I'm so glad I've spoken after you, because I think for me one of my uh, my two points. Let me um, begin with the first one. Is I was going to say financial institutions, especially in Kenya or in Africa, record big prof profits. And I want to give the responsibility to you to be the ones to deal with that issue called poverty. I also know there's a lot of funds that go around as grants. There are a lot of grants that go around to come and help um, you know, Africa that get given to people like you because they say, oh, we don't want to disseminate them. And that is what you people can do. You have the muscle to help that farmer to be able to deal with his issue, whether you will support them through you know, organizations, whether they're NGOs or UNGC, to relocate, to educate them. But I do feel the responsibility lies with the large fi with financial institutions purely because you have the muscle you can influence the other thing is also down to the issue around your um, you know the youth population uh, africa i know we they say 84% of the businesses are youth um, no, SM, uh, sme sorry smes will never appreciate the sdgs because again they are start struggling to survive but I would like to appreciate what Safaricom did in building what they call integrating sustainability into their supply chain. Because if I came to supply tea, which I do by the way, um, to Safaricom, they would tell me, Have you, do you know about the 10 principles? And they would educate you. So again, it's an appeal to the larger organizations, not only now financial institutions, but the larger organizations to build it into their supply chain. Because that is the only way the smaller businesses will be able, not only, sorry, but it is one of the strongest ways that the smaller businesses will be able to, 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 to see it and appreciate it and grow. And I do know one of my board members was one, has actually done that. She went to Safaricom to supply, I think it was one thing, and has actually gone into the green environment just by the interaction with Safaricom. So I think the responsibility is to the larger organizations, financial institutions, and the larger, you know, the EABLs, to actually um, cascade this down. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. So we'll close it at that point. Oh, one more. Well, go ahead. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Karim, Karim Das Mohamed. I'm from IPS, uh, which is part of the Aga Khan Development Network. Um, and I'm also the CEO for Frigocan, so I don't know if many people know about it. But um, I was just following up on the Muranga story because I must let you know, we work with farmers in the Muranga area as well as many parts of the country for the last 30 years. 
We've been working with over 70,000 farmers so far, small scale farmers, with an impact of over a million people with the income that we generate, that they generate from the, from the crops they grow for us. It's based on the sustainability business. It's based on the fact that we have a contractual obligation both ways. It's based on the fact that we give them tools in terms of skills, management training, and training in terms of how to grow the crop so that we can then use those crops for exporting as processed value-added products to the European market. Today, the product that we supply with the global leaders, we supply 65% of the global market of that particular product. So, there are success stories. Partnerships is extremely important. Following what Flora said, I had a conversation yesterday, a very interesting conversation. I won't name the bank, very big bank in this country, called me up. Out of the blue saying, we've got an agro strategy, we'd like to work together with you. I said, fine, let's work, let's talk. And the first thing they came up with was how they could supply, I mean, how they could get, engage our art growers by supplying them with, in, uh, with, with credit so that they could facilitate our business. And I said, I don't need it. Because I'm facilitating them with interest-free credit in the inputs that I supply to them, which I recover at the end of the crop. So what do I need your interest for, for the farmer? Now, I think Flora has made a point there. There are lots of grants, lots of soft money that comes into this country, dispersed to the banks. And instead of charging market rate to the farmers, please charge them something that they can afford to pay back. Please do not make those large amounts of interest. Please. If, they, if you really want to help them, that's how you help them. But help them so that it's sustainable. I also am talking to my NGO friends. Please, when you bring programs in, make them sustainable. Don't just come and make a program so that then, at the end of the day, the farmers don't know what to do with what they've been given. I'm talking about irrigation pumps. I'm talking about several other things. Many other things that I can talk about. But ultimately, just one thing I want to leave all the corporate. Don't talk about CSR. Talk about SRC, socially responsible corporates. Incorporate it in your DNA. Make it part of your business model. A socially responsible corporate will make sure that you talk about all your stakeholders, right from your supply chain to your customers. Thank you. Wow, excellent, excellent, excellent. <laughs> Sustainable help, socially responsible corporates. Before we listen to the final comments of Mr. Jam, yes, all right, ah, Ms. Gage, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, sorry, my apologies. I just need to respond. Uh. <laughs> my apologies. Um, um, it's a conversation. First and foremost, I do acknowledge that the banks have a very big role to play uh, in this space. So we will not run. We acknowledge it and we will take responsibility for it. Uh, what have we done? Uh, first and foremost, uh, as an industry, I have a program for women and they work with uh, a lot of work. And, uh, I mean, certainly for Stan Big Ambassador, we will tell you we've worked with them now almost two years sustainably. Um, so we, we do have programs for SMEs and we do support that. Secondly, funding for, for, for bank, for, for free funding as you call it. I can give you an example with Stan Big, so I'll give you a practical example. We, we, had, we signed an MOU with the Ministry of Industrialization um, where we're working with them in all the markets. And basically, we got money, as you spoke about grant money, from GIZ, from Microsoft, from USID, um, uh, Facebook, UNDP, which were actually giving out as interest-free loans to women and men, or young men, who were affected by COVID. The short story of it is that when we had COVID, people were, you know, the small market traders, uh, we call them shoeshine loans, actually. Basically, they were getting the small traders with 3,000, 5,000 shillings, COVID happened, markets were shut down, no one was going anywhere. Um, if I use a vernacular word, they ate up their capital. COVID, we reopened the markets, they don't have that money anymore. We are giving them money to start up, uh, to restart that. That money, you charge a 1% interest, a 2% interest, it's not an interest administration fee. You get the money, you roll it over, you give somebody else. We've started that in, uh, um, I know in um, Lakipia, La we're doing that in Nakuru, we're in Meru. Um, this coming week, we're going to uh, uh, Kisumu, we've been going to Mikuri. We've been working with the ministry as part of that. Secondly, we've been offering training. 
Uh, the ministry has given us 47 training centers across the country. We've signed a transaction with uh, Microsoft. Microsoft is providing free software for all of them. The ministry is loading content, both the Ministry of Industrialization, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Agriculture, for all of them to be trained. Last year, we trained 50,000 people. The target is to get 500,000 by the end of the year, by the end of next year. So work has already started. So we actually are doing that as part of that. The work that we spoke about in Muranga, we started working with Nature Conservancy to support that initiative so that we can also help them be sustainable in the process. So we actually do recognize the importance of the work that is happening and we work with them to ensure that we get through that. The grant money that we're mobilizing because of our capacity to raise money, we're giving it back, not as loans, but as just almost a grant money. The only thing is you pay it back almost interest free so that we allow it to keep rolling and support people. So we are doing that as banks. So we're not always giving loans uh, as in 5%, 10% loans. We also do give free money and almost every other bank is doing that. And we really appreciate that you are challenging us to do it. We keep doing more and we will continue supporting um, particularly the SMEs, the youth, the women and a whole lot of other groups that we believe need support uh, as part of that journey. The plan is that we need to get 100, 500,000 people back into jobs who lost their jobs due to COVID. And the banks are actually driving that. Thank you. Well, thank you so much indeed. Because of time, of course, work has already started. We'll move to this. All right. Ah, so we have Ambassador as well. Kindly allow us to. OK, Ambassador, go ahead. Yeah, but thank you very much. I just want to speak to the issue of uh, public sector and how it can uh, contribute because uh, Peter B. Watt, who was once on our side, has now gone to the other side. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it is important for the private sector to consume certain things. It's, it's part of our charity. We do have now in place the registrar of SMEs. It's an office in the public service. It's actually at our ministry. And this is the registrar who now gives you a certificate of registration as an SME. And for that, you go through a series of diligence. So the way we define SME, especially at the UN level, is very different from the way we define SMEs here. In fact, if you go to the US, Safaricom is an SME. You may think it's a bigger company, but there are other bigger companies there. So we have to create a definition so that that definition is legal, and Africa in context. And then when you talk about the conduct of our financial sector, Stan Bing can say their story here, which is a good story. But when you go to the rural areas, and you encounter these mothers who are being terrorized by these banks, I feel very sad. They go take the old lady's water tank, sweep her utensils away, even animals. That has to stop. If they really subscribe to this theory of corporate social responsibility, and they are big names. And number three, when we are talking about the value chains, those of us who are in uh, Dubai, I can see Carol here, I can see Flora Mutai. There was this group of uh, women from the pastoralist communities, the Uchaka group. <coughs> they had brought these beads. So they were very happy that they had sold everything. And I talked to them and I said, how can we take you a step Father. These are women just doing video work and so on. What lesson did I learn? 
there's a lot of power in women when they actually decide to do something. But the other side of trade is in the procurement of intermediate products. And that's what I'd like to see these big corporates doing. Why can't a big corporate, for example, use the facilities set up by the government through the constituency industrial development centers? These are public spaces with enough uh, free, uh, free of rent, installed with three-phase power. If you bring an equipment there for whatever make, it's free, it's a dummy. We have 156 of them throughout the country. But what are we seeing? They are being encroached by our very own people. We have cases in court where they are saying, oh, I think we burn a politician in front. I feel like now telling them, do you really think you are doing the right thing? Showing me a title, and you know very well this is public crowd. But that's not the point. The point is this. If we buy these women, those social corporate intermediate products, they'll be able to make millions of these products and sell them. And when we are going to such exhibitions, like the one we have in Dubai, we carry them around. So I just wanted to respond to that to say the public space is there. What we need is serious communication. And those of you who are engaging with the grassroots, please do it in a manner that will help. Uh, Aga Khan Foundation, for whatever you are doing, remember the space that we have provided in the partnership agreement with the EU and the UK. I'm now inviting you personally because on the 18th of this month, Ambassador Omamo in uh, Brussels signed, and I was agreed that statement, a commitment by the Kenya government to reopen the EPA. And what are we doing about that? It's because we have taken so long to make progress. And we have decided as government, we cannot start on the same point and try to tell our neighboring countries, please come, they are just marking feet because they are least developed. Shall we out? We need, to, we need to move this country forward. And moving the country forward means taking decisive action. So we are going to open the space for expansion of our trade with the European Union. And the governments don't trade. It is you people who trade. So to Mefugua Murango, and it's that thing, I think, when is the 23rd? We have the first meeting. But that is internal. So I just wanted to share that with you, just to indicate that there's that need for greater uh, communication sharing, information sharing, and a partnership with uh, these great organizations, especially the UN and the other related bodies. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Because of time, we'll just have two more. Then we close with Miss Ojambo's comments. We have Ms. Shiro here. Uh -huh. So three more. All right, all right. Go ahead. Uh, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. May I My just kindly interrupt? I will, because of time, I'll just time it. So once you hear the little bell, I'd kindly request that you wrap it up. Please go ahead. Okay. My name is Mary Duo. I'm a, I'm a catalyst for change. And I speak for, I'm a voice for the voiceless. I speak for those people who cannot, um, who are vulnerable and uh, marginalized. Uh, the reason why I thought that I should um, speak is uh, because um, of uh, another uh, one thing I've uh, thought is that uh, as leaders, as business leaders, what we need to do with most of uh, most of what we do, we need uh, one of uh, is uh, we need collaborations. We need to come together. Uh, as someone said, um, we we uh, the government alone cannot be able to solve the problems that are there. And uh, for us in my organization, what we have done is that we have started thinking out of the box not only uh, facing the challenges that we face in our uh, our organization we also looking outside the, the the society what is it we came up with a program called cycling to work and when we came up to with the program cycling to work during covid co during covid when covid came i ran a cleaning company and uh, we have low low income people vulnerable people marginalized people and we thought that we need to give them bicycles to ride 
to and from uh, to work and uh, and, ba and back to their homes. One, it helped them on economic benefits. If they were using 5,000 shillings to go to work, now they can use they can use that 5,000 to maybe for their children education or do something meaningful. The other thing was about climate change. But out of the 10 people we gave the bicycles, five of them got accidents. They were knocked on the road. One on Waiyaki Way, one on Ombasa Road. Another one had to leave his bicycle on the road. Right now we have just spoken about how can we solve uh, poverty? How can we eradicate poverty? So um, what I have come to see is that um, as business leaders, let's also look at the within ourselves and around our, our environment. What is it that uh, we are having problem? How can I solve? So for us, we are now going to the government and looking for collaboration and saying, we do not have cycling lanes. Can we, can we think about the cycling lanes? People are dying on the road. Every day someone is dying on the road. We do not have a um, pedestrian walk with. Can we, uh, can we talk about this? So as business leaders, not, let's not just look at, um, uh, let's have a broader way of thinking and solving issues that uh, even in our communities, those workers at your workplace, they are going to cycle, they are going to have accidents. So let's uh, think about this. Well, let's look at broader, broader issues. Thank you so much indeed. We'll take quick, quick comments. My, uh, my apologies, we can start with uh, Ms. Shiro on the, this other side, then MSK Chair. Good morning all. Karibu um, nyumbani sanda. Uh, my name is Shiro Waweru Waidaka. I'm an SME. Um, not in a report, not as a token, but in real life. It's fantastic that Sanda, you're including SMEs now. And I'm looking forward to the meeting next week where we stop being data and let's make it tangible. Not because of the SDGs by the UN, but Africa does not have the luxury of time to keep skirting around the issues of sustainability. So there's a lot of corporates here I know, some I bank with them. Um, let's sit, let's actually sit across the table from each other, not in a report, and make it tangible. There's a lot of work that has been done, but I beg you, there's so much more that should be done. And I believe we can do it if we sit across the room from each other. Thank you very much. Oh, excellent. Ms. Kitcher, want a karaoke? All right, before that. Good morning, everybody. I'm a founder of Together for Better Foundation. Um, thank you, UN Global Compact, for putting us all together under this room today at the round table. I will talk on behalf of grassroots organizations, and I can see this room is full of opportunity because I see all the CEOs sitting at the round table. Please, my request or my challenge will be look into the grassroots organizations who are the direct impacting with the UN global sustainability goals and supporting the vulnerable. It could be the, any of these vulnerable in our community or in our country. Thank you so much for UN global impact putting us together at this table. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's come into this table, please. This table. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Charles Karayuki. I'm the Managing Director for AR Healthcare. I'll not talk about healthcare because my colleague Tosifia already talked about it. Because in healthcare we say we are in the business of saving lives, so we can't even quantify the impact we make in society. But we are happy to also ask for support from everybody so that we can continue saving lives. Um, I also sit in the local board. I'm very proud of uh, Sanda because he used to sit with her in the board. My comment also, I'm the chair of the Marketing Society of Kenya. Everybody goes around here and talks about their success stories. They're quite inspiring. But I think we don't tell our stories enough. So we'll mobilize our marketers to help organizations tell their stories. Thank you. Sorry, this, this way, please. Then we will kindly have Ms. Sand. Sorry, sorry for that. Hi, enough. Um, I also sit in the board of the um, local network here for the Global Compact. Now, and I'm an SME. I run an SME business. I've been at Safaricom as a supplier for 22 years. Now, 
I have seen a lot of transformation where Safaricom has intentionally changed their policy to support women in business. I have predominantly been in the events industry and because of that support, I have now become an engineer. I am not an engineer, but I now run an engineering business. One of the reasons why I have succeeded to do this is through mentorship. Please, Rebecca, stand up. Rebecca has been my mentor for a very long time. She is one of the women at Safaricom who, you know, um, uh, bro broke, broke through the barrier. Now, one of the reasons why SMEs continue, even with great support from Safari companies like Safaricom and others, is finance. So I have an LPO from Safaricom for building sites or providing renewable energy to sites. <laughs> Safaricom has gone further and they have MOUs with banks. They actually brought the banks to the table. So Safaricom has said bank A, B, C, D, when you have an LPO, go to these banks. But you know what happens when you go? nothing happens. So, from my experience, right now, I have a project that I had to get out of Kenya, and it hurt me so much, to go to the US to get a venture capitalist to fund my project. Why should I take my money out there? You are there, KCB is there, ABSA is there, all these banks have MOUs with Safaricom and none of them accepted to fund my project. Because first of all, how did Safaricom give you such a, is it believable? You're not even an engineer. How do we trust that you will deliver? But Safaricom believes in me. So why don't you connect with Safaricom, go to them, ask them why they found it valuable to partner with us and then fund it through there. The other problem is I come with an LPO, you fund 80% and you leave me to sort the other 20%. Is it not possible to take the project throughout, pay the duties and everything, we deliver to Safaricom, Safaricom pays, collect your money. That way it's more sustainable. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Kindly allow us to stop there for now. We'll have a networking session immediately after this. But for now, please, a big round of applause to Miss Sander. Just giving her remarks on what has been shared. But she will still come back again to give us more details right now, her comments in regards to what has been spoken about. Go ahead. Thank you. And, and thank you all very much for your feedback and your questions. It was actually what I was looking forward to most, uh, having uh, invited you all over here today. I won't respond to what has been spoken to already, but wanted to talk to three areas. I think first is um, the SME space. And um, you know, uh, Shira and both Wamboy have, have spoken to that, as well as others in the room. And I'll, I'll give my comments in the context of our strategy and, and some of the work that we're doing. Uh, one of the reasons why the SME sector is particularly important to us, actually there are three. Uh, the first is that for the multinationals in the room, we all know that SMEs are probably members of your supply chain or your value chain at some point in time. And we often say the weakest part of any large company is probably their supply chain. And uh, sustainability work has shown us that it's probably the area where there's the least transparency because people focus on what happens at the corporate HQ. Sometimes you don't really know what's happening down in different, different parts of your supply chain, different areas of the country, different uh, industrial sectors. So for us, it's really important to be able to build resiliency and transparency uh, into supply chains and into the SME sector. And that's what we really hope our strategy will help uh, do to some extent. The second area is just SMEs on their own. And I think Wamboy has highlighted some of the challenges here. And our, our hope through the Africa strategy is that we'll be able to build ecosystems of support, such that when one is engaging with uh, the SME sector or suddenly running their business, that you take an ecosystem approach. Um, you know, uh, Wamboy has highlighted the example of, of Safaricom. 
uh, where, you know, in setting up the Women in Business Network, you know, banks were also brought to the fore, a mentorship circle was built, and many other elements brought together to create an ecosystem-wide response. I think this sort of broad support for the SME sector is needed uh, in order to build that resilience. Again, it's another area that we hope will come to being through the partnerships that we espouse through the strategy. Uh, somebody spoke about young people. Again, you know, statistics will show that the SME sector is primarily run by women, but driven by young people. And you know, young people tend to, to, do, to do the grunt work, to be doing the, the trading, the selling, the manufacturing, whatever it is that the sector is doing. Our hope also is that uh, through the Africa strategy and the SME strategy, we'll be able to create decent work opportunities for young people, uh, bring in innovation, uh, allow them to be able to, to benefit from learnings, from exposure, from experience, to other, from other businesses within uh, ecosystems as a whole. So the approaches that we built in and what we hope our local network here will help us drive should certainly address a few of the challenges, not all, because some I think there's great local solutions in the room. By no means are we saying that sitting in, in New York we've devised the foolproof strategy, but we certainly think that the partnerships approach, the ecosystems approach, and looking through your entire supply chain should be able to address that. So that's one area. Um, the second, I just wanted to respond to the climate question and really uh, focus on what I'd mentioned in my comments around what we'd like to do in terms of mobilizing African business leaders, which is really working with African private sector to build up a strong position for climate in the lead up to the climate conference. Anyone who followed the proceedings in Glasgow knows that, you know, where the big faults emerged was the fact that the world, having gone through its own transition, was now imposing upon developing and emerging economies, a transition that was not in line with many national development plans, many manufacturing and industrialization plans. And I don't think the position is that countries want to continue polluting, no. I think the position is that everyone is willing to make energy and climate transitions, but at a pace that is just in terms of you know, their financing and access to finance, in terms of jobs and the creation of green jobs, and in terms of just managing the overall transitions. So what we hope to do with the African Business Leaders Coalition is mobilize business leaders, certainly a number from Kenya um, and from our other four hubs, to come together and put a strong private sector position around private sector responses towards COP27. Um, we, as I said, will be speaking into it later uh, during the week. We have strong support from the Deputy Secretary General, uh, my boss Amina Mohammed. She'll be leading that effort and really bringing together um, African private sector to, to forge forward on a positive foot for COP27. Uh, really looking forward to, to that as a whole. The final piece I wanted to talk to was about sustainable finance. Sorry, I didn't see uh, who raised the question. And also to Mr. Seo, your question about how do we balance the basics of, of poverty and, and the fundamentals of development, as well as some of the more macro level goals that we're talking about around shifting and moving financing. Um, you know, for us, we see value in the two approaches. I think what we say in sustainable business is let's see how you can shift your business operations processes and strategies. And in so doing, you actually will ultimately impact what I call more of the developmental goals, poverty, health, and education in some way, shape, and form. And if I just pick up on your example around uh, the river uh, bed and, and the farmers there, I think our thinking is that if a company is more mindful of its environmental footprint, it would do, for example, less damage to what it does around effluence and, and pollution and, and managing, for example, downstream flows of water, if, for example, it was uh, impacting the riverbed that you're talking about. Or if, for example, they were able to find ways to use um, the resources that they have, be it in terms of fresh water supplies, et cetera, to provide it to communities. I think that the question is the sustainability of that approach and whether or not it's more, um, more efficient to look at an overall system-wide approach to address what we're trying to change in terms of long-term water supply, access to finance, access to quality seeds, better uh, soil technology, et cetera, and then see how that might overall uplift the, the communities as we go ahead. I mean, I know, and as Chairman Joe said here, I worked in the Safaricom Foundation for many years, so I, don't, I do see the importance of philanthropy 
and the change that it can bring about in development. But at the same time, I think one of the, the big learnings uh, from the UN in terms of sustainable development was the fact that sometimes shifting overall business approaches can actually result in a lot more macro benefits. So, you know, the two approaches definitely can work um, hand in hand as, as we go forward. And I think there's been some great suggestions from the room in that regard. Um, we're doing some really good work on financing for development or sustainable finance and mobilizing macro level financing for issues such as, you know, bonds, um, issues such as infrastructure development, and work with large companies and banks to be able to do that as well. So our desire, again, as you'll see in the Africa strategy, is to be able to convince suppliers of capital, banks, uh, large companies to just invest more in projects that are SDG related and move their financing towards SDG projects and see how that can help transform the African continent. So I'll, I'll stop my comments there, but thank you very much for all of the feedback, well noted, and um, you know, for the local network, we truly look forward to incorporating these comments and help us drive forward on the strategy. So thank you very much. Thank you so much indeed. We'll now quickly move to another address here. He's an author, speaker, and entrepreneur focused on data, strategy, and marketing in digital Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the founder and CEO, Nendo Limited, Mark Kaiwa. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Principal Secretary, um, Ambassador Weru, CEO and Executive Director, Sando Jambo. Board member, UN Global Compact, Flora Mutai, CEOs, and invited guests, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'll take you, hopefully, to something that's been in your WhatsApp groups and is actually on the headlines of the papers today. Captain Ruth Karauri, one of our very own, right? And watching that video of her bringing that massive, beast in the sky, um, going against the elements, using the best of human judgment, technology, engineering, and keeping her passengers and everyone in the plane safe, calm, composed, as she brings the plane slowly into land after Storm Eunice. I can't think of a better analogy to describe the work and the role of being the leader of a business, and for many of you, you are the captains of Dreamliners. For some of us, <laughs> these are um, what I would call um, handcrafted, homemade um, air <laughs> aircrafts and flying contraptions. Or, as Shiro rightly put it, um, SMEs, as we are sometimes described. So we are in the same storm, Eunice. And guess what we have to do? We have to bring in our rickety, sometimes shaky, you know, unsteady planes into land. Um, and we still have to serve our beloved clients in flight, drinks, and entertainment. <laughs> and that is really the challenge. Um, I'm so glad. I think so many of the remarks you'll hear me share today have actually been said. I was like, this is uncanny, just hearing people speak. Uh, but I run an SME myself um, in the research and marketing space. And for me, the company uh, called Nendo, we do uh, research and marketing work studying how Africans um, and recently even Indians use technology um, and, and giving advice and running campaigns around that. And it's um, also special that I got the opportunity to speak um, after Mr. Joe Gutu because uh, I will be very honest, sustainability was not <laughs> top of my agenda with my little aircraft. Um, I'm just trying to see the next few yards to, to navigate um, in my own storm units. But a few years ago, uh, we got a letter and I believe um, Sanda might have still been at Safaricom, uh, and I've heard from so many Safaricom uh, suppliers here, so I beg your pardon if you hear us, you know, talk about Safaricom in this way. I can tell you it was not my plan to become a sustainable thinking enterprise. We just survive. I wanted to be a surviving enterprise before anything else. And uh, when we got the letter, it initiated essentially a process for us which said, you're part of our suppliers. We expect you. <laughs> to join UNGC. So we reached out to Judy um, and her team and we got a warm welcome. Um, we joined quite early um, and for me I was really lucky in the sense that my team embraced the challenge and they had such a vivid imagination about what it is that we could do together to actually do more um, than just submit reports but actually embed that into the work that we do. And so for us, 
the best example I can think of was really COVID. When COVID hit, um, I uh, initiated a process to have us start working remotely. Um, on the 16th of March, 2022, it'll be two years working remotely. And in fact, we're now a remote first company. We have an office still, but we work um, remotely by design. People call in to their daily <laughs> meeting from Kisumu, Thika, different places. I'm always a bit surprised because they sound like they're right next to me. But for us in our SME journey, COVID was a really tough time. Um, those are, that was the real storm, Eunice, I think, for us. Um, we came very, very close to saying goodbye to some really great and, and, um, uh, and you know, appreciated members of my team, but managed to navigate the storm much like Captain Kareori uh, did in the video we all saw. And when the UN Global Compact asked for uh, videos of what CEOs are doing, um, I actually had a bit of imposter syndrome. I was like, but I just ran an SME. Am I going to submit a video with all these other um, captains of industry with you know, tens of thousands of employees across the world? But I did. And when my team encouraged me, and I talked about exactly what we were doing, um, and we were among the first in Africa to do so. And I was so appreciative of uh, the UNGC giving us that opportunity to lead by example and talk about exactly what we were doing. Um, one of the biggest things we did is we published trend and industry reports. We waived all of our copyright, um, instead listing it under Creative Commons. That's allowed universities, um, small and medium-sized businesses, all sorts of people to benefit from a lot of the research we get paid to do. Now we're actually carving out and using hundreds of hours of billable hours a year, but investing that in our sustainability agenda. And the proof for me came, I think, in um, 2019, we, prob we published a trend report looking at 10 sectors of the economy and how they'd be affected by COVID for the better and for the worse. And um, I remember getting a call from somebody at The Nation. I know Clifford, he might have left, but he was here just now. Um, they basically said, can we take everything you've written <laughs> and just put a full page um, and we'll give you credit. We'll take every single word and try to be as faithful to it. And I said, that would be the biggest compliment to me. And so they, they ran a full page ad with a lot of what we'd put out to to basically predict what would happen. And it later got featured in the New York Times, which was our first time um, getting any sort of mention or publicity there. And this from our sustainability initiatives as a really small company, <laughs> um, you know, about a dozen or so employees um, and, and uh, maybe another dozen uh, contractors and freelancers. Uh, and this week, I told uh, Judy when she asked me to come and share some remarks, I, was, uh, I said it's perfect timing um, because last week, I announced a new company benefit that I've been working on for the last six months, um, which is uh, Nendo Now for all full-time employees, um, has engaged a very prolific and respected counseling psychologist. And for people, especially young people, exploring and understanding their mental health, it's the same as their physical health. Many of us might go to the gym because of these lifestyle challenges and, um, and, and just where life has us. Uh, mental health is just as important. And the pandemic has shown us that, as that's time and time again been spoken of. So Nendo now has, um, will pay for or sponsor up to five sessions with um, this uh, counseling psychologist, whether it's therapy or counseling, or people just discovering about themselves, taking out that barrier for people to prioritize and work on their mental health. That was just last week on Thursday. And ultimately, I'm, I'm lucky I have a champion internally. Um, I have a lot of um, ownership from the team. Uh, every new teammate who joins our organization is onboarded from day one to start producing ideas. I think they have a, <laughs> it, they don't have to be good ideas. I'm just like, just bring ideas. We'd rather have many and decide what few ones to do and to act on. But ultimately, my encouragement for SMEs, much like you've heard, is just having a vivid imagination for sustainability. It sounds big, it sounds lofty, it sounds very unreachable. Uh, but at least for us, we were able to find that there are some things in our grasp, right with the actual work we do, that we're able to, uh, to deliver. And now I think sustainability can and should be, in your supply chains, a differentiator, right? Are you prioritizing companies that are actually living out um, the agenda besides being part of or subscribed to the UN Global Compact? Um, for us, luckily, we've been able to, as I said, position ourselves and practice it. Um, and I, <laughs> much like I, I want to shout out uh, Rebecca Wanjiku as well. I think she's, uh, she's such a, a leading light and she really opened my imagination up. I remember her being uh, celebrated as one of the suppliers of the year um, some time back. And watching the video and the montage, I said, wow, I mean, um, it, it really made uh, something special to me. And wrapping up, I think Storm Unis today for all of us is um, it's the turbulence we experience. Many have said it's an election year. Things are up in the air. We don't know. 
Um, we might not decide. Um, I really hope you pay your suppliers in time. That is always my, if I have this stage and this mic, that's the one thing I'll say. Uh, we're going to do the work for sure, but um, if payments can come on time, that, that's one of the biggest things I know with, um, with other SMEs I speak to. Um, and ultimately for me, I have to give credit where it's due. It wasn't my plan, it wasn't in my vision or my, <laughs> my OKRs to, to become a sustainable business. I, I, I'll be honest, I was sort of nudged and pushed <laughs> and I responded. And so I'll encourage you, I think, to explore that because for many of us, you know, we have such creative mindsets with our, our aircraft, um, but, but sometimes we need that nudge and that push to, to move and make that first step. So with uh, the rest of you and your Dreamliners, all the best. Bring them into land nice and safe. Uh, we'll keep watching you as you fly a little higher than us. Uh, but for us, I'm glad the UNGC has created the opportunity for SMEs to participate, to have the opportunity to have the mic here today. And for me, I think it's possible and it's necessary, not just for your shareholders or our shareholders, but for our staff and best of all, for society. Thank you. For society, thank you so much. From a surviving enterprise to a sustainable thinking one. Sustainability as a differentiator. Ladies and gentlemen, we want to now welcome the 2022 new joiners into the UN Global Compact. And to guide us through that, a warm round of applause once again to Miss Sanda. Makofi Tafadali. Please guide us through. Thank you very much, and um, as we come to the end of the program, just wanted to take some time to recognize some new joiners to the Global Compact. As you know, it's a membership organization, and uh, always pleased to, to welcome new members. I think what's been really interesting about this pandemic period, actually, is that globally within the Global Compact, we've had our highest rate of growth. Um, of members. You know, when the pandemic struck, um, I had just joined the team, and to some extent, the team thought, wow, this is it. Maybe we will have to slow down our operations. Maybe businesses will not be interested in, in the work that we do, but it was the total opposite. Um, we continue to grow in leaps and bounds globally, and really pleased to also see that there's great growth here uh, in Kenya. So I just wanted to take a few moments to acknowledge and recognize new joiners, and there's a joining letter, and we can certainly do a handshake or a fist bump, uh, whatever is most appropriate. But more importantly, it's really to, to signify the CEO level commitment that is required for joining the Global Compact, uh, the fact that we ask uh, new members to really adhere to the 10 principles that we've spoken about. There is a reporting requirement where you should transparently report on your progress. And certainly, um, as has been said, we would love to hear the stories of progress and the transformation that you're making within your sectors and uh, in Kenya's development space. So with that, I'd like to just call up uh, three companies that we have here. The first is the Standard Media Group, and we have the CEO, Mr. Orlando Liomu, here. So just to recognize Standard Group, and, and welcome to the Global Compact family. Um, the second company is Zitova, who's represented by Brenda Oyer. Brenda? Uh, to Safaricom, um, Zetova was just telling me they're a technology company with about 70% women in their workforce. <laughs> and last but not least is MedSource Group, represented by the CEO Vinod Guptam.
Well, welcome to the new joiners, and um, certainly there's a whole new range of programming that the Global Compact will offer, so we look forward to your really active um, participation as we go forward. Thank you very much. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It was an honor being part of this CEO's round table and we are now coming to that place where we want to close. So to close for us, please put your hands together for Miss Judy Ngino, Executive Director, Global Compact Network Kenya. Big round of applause, please. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, um, time is uh, much spent. So allow me to just give a quick vote of uh, thanks and gratitude to all of you uh, for taking the time to join us for the launch of this very special um, Africa strategy. It is our strategy as Kenya. It is our strategy as Africa. Um, so I think as we, we've had uh, throughout the day, Africa has a unique opportunity to develop on a sustainable pathway. And I think it's important that we understand and we need to own that. We need to seize this moment. So it's our time and let us actually take the initiative uh, to take on uh, the role of operationalizing this particular strategy. So just to recap, the strategy has ad outlined three key priorities uh, that need addressing for Kenya as well as the larger Africa continent. Uh, focusing both uh, on growing impact through focus We'll also be looking at driving inclusive impact and leveraging association supply chains as well as sources of capital. Allow me to also just take this opportunity to thank um, the people who are really involved in this process of developing the strategy, our global compact team in New York, our tw 10 local networks across the continent who are really instrumental in feeding uh, input and reach feedback into the strategy and how it will actually take, take shape uh, for the continent. I'd also like to thank our board members present here today who've also been very instrumental in giving of their time as well as their resources and feedback uh, into this particular strategy. And also for steering the local network to become really the fit for purpose organization that will help uh, breathe life into this particular strategy. So thanks again also to my colleagues who have been, you know, hard at work for the last uh, week or so, trying to get everything together for this particular event. Uh, we don't take it for granted uh, that we have this opportunity to gather with you all here in person. Uh, I, I believe, I think since COVID, um, we've really just had the opportunity to interact virtually. But hopefully as we go along, we'll be able to also have more of these types of inter interactions with yourselves I think it makes for a more meaningful engagement uh, for us, for, for all of us. Uh, so just allow me to just say again a big thank you for the time that you have taken uh, to join us. And we look forward to the next steps in making this uh, strategy come alive. I thank you all. Well, thank you so much indeed. It was an honor serving you as the moderator. All the best as we continue focusing on being united across the globe, for the globe, still in the business of making a better world. We've come to the end. All the best. See you at work.